key factor in the war in Ukraine has been the ability to hit targets well behind the front lines, destroying enemy logistics, disrupting operations, and inflicting attrition on critical targets. Russia began the war with a huge advantage in this area, equipped as it was with a variety of modern missile systems. The arrival of HIMARS in Ukraine in 2022 gave them a tool to partly redress the balance, and rapid attacks on Russian ammunition depots seem to have had a significant impact on Russian battlefield performance. But for almost a year now, Russia has been trying to adapt to the HIMARS threat, dispersing and hardening targets or simply moving them out of range. In response, Ukraine has long requested longer-range weapon systems, requests that were constantly denied. Recently, that all changed with the announcement that UK-built Storm Shadow air-launched cruise missiles had been supplied to Ukraine. Storm Shadow has finally given Ukraine a weapon capable of striking anywhere in occupied Ukrainian territory. And over the last fortnight, the missile has announced its presence with strikes from Mariupol in the south to Luhansk in the northeast. And it makes now the perfect time to talk about the important role long-range weapons have played in Ukraine. The distinction between tactical and operational fires. The adaptations both sides are making to try and mitigate the effect of opposing weapon systems. And what systems like Storm Shadow or the ADM-160 likely mean for Ukraine's long-range fire capability going forward because you can bet with the war in Ukraine being one of the most watched in human history, other countries are closely observing how systems like these perform. And so I also want to look at some of the lessons they might be taking and how it might shape their procurement decisions. To do that, I'm going to give a brief intro on the role of long-range fires and look at the equipment and capability of both Ukraine and Russia before the war broke out. Then I'm going to look at the 2022 experience, the impact that the introduction of HIMARS and M270 had, and the various ways in which Russia adapted and improved, both in response and in an attempt to gain further military advantage. Then I'm going to discuss the importance of Storm Shadow's introduction, and how we might expect Ukraine and Russia's options for long-range strike to change going forward, closing out with an observation on how some of these lessons may be shaping decision-making around the globe. But first, a word from today's sponsor. And today I welcome back returning sponsor and my VPN of choice, Private Internet Access. By now, most of us are probably aware of the threats to our privacy online and the consequences that can follow if things go wrong. To use an analogy, if you follow my kind of content, you've probably heard of the survivability onion, which captures the idea that a lot of things need to go wrong in sequence for an armored vehicle or a system like it to be destroyed. And that long before you get to the point of relying on some sort of passive material defense like your armor, your first line of defense is probably not being exposed, seen, targeted, or hit in the first place. You can think about protecting online privacy in a similar way. Layers of tools and practices that help keep you safe. And a VPN can help provide one of those layers. Using a VPN, one or two clicks can conceal your IP address, change your perceived location, and improve your privacy, especially on public networks. And in an era where major firms seem to constantly suffer from major data breaches, private internet access gains a distinct advantage. Because they advertise an independently audited and court-tested no-logs policy. And one of the best ways to be sure your data won't be stolen is for it not to exist in the first place. It probably won't save you if you post your social security number online, or if you open random email links, but it is an additional step towards online safety. The service also allows you to connect to high-speed VPN servers in 84 countries worldwide. It's easy to use, available across multiple platforms, and it's compatible with a range of streaming services. And the kicker is that at a time when many services are cracking down on things like account sharing, a private internet access subscription just allows you to protect an unlimited number of devices. So if you're interested, there's a link in the description that'll give you 83% off a two-year subscription plus four additional bonus months with the protection of a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're interested, please do check it out. Okay, so when I'm talking about long-range fires and the impact they've had in Ukraine, it's probably helpful to understand what I'm talking about. Because depending on what manual you read from, those words are going to mean different things to different people. And so to help give some context as to why Ukraine has constantly been requesting these weapons, how they may be used, and what impact they might have, I want to talk more generally about how you might use fires against targets for different purposes at different ranges. One simplified way of thinking about how a military might use missiles or artillery is to break targets up into three separate brackets. The strategic, the operational, and the tactical. With the caveat here that this is a grossly simplified view, and these brackets, as I'm defining them, are probably not going to be military manual compliant. In any case, these categories differ in a variety of ways, including the range at which you're likely to be engaging, what sort of targets you're likely to be firing at, what you're likely to be firing, why you're choosing to fire at it, and how you find the target. 
Right on the front line, for example, you might be engaging tactical targets like individual vehicles or positions. The goal here might be to try and help a company take a hill or a position by using something like an artillery piece to destroy defending tanks that you spotted using a little DJI drone. But out behind the defense lines, there might be targets that make it possible for all of the enemy units to do their job and as such are operationally significant. Things like airfields or major ammunition depots, for example, are usually not going to be positioned right behind a frontline trench. And so if you hit them, it's going to be with a longer range weapon system and you're going to find them using something like a longer range drone or a satellite. Now, generally speaking, these targets correlate with range. Tactical targets are probably going to be closer, strategic targets further away. But there's no hard and fast rule. And if your enemy does, for example, obligingly put a major ammunition depot 500 meters behind the front line, then there's no rule that says you can't use your shorter range weapons to destroy it. But just to clarify this point, let's quickly whip through those three brackets. Within that tactical category, the target is usually going to be enemy forces. Troops, tanks, artillery pieces, individual fighting positions. And the goal is to achieve an impact at a tactical level, whether that's just inflicting attrition on opposing forces or doing something specific like repelling an attack or taking a position. In Ukraine, where defensive lines might run 5 to as far as 30 kilometers deep, this is where you're going to see everything from automatic grenade launchers and mortars up to tank rounds and tube artillery. It's also where you're going to see most of the counter-battery fight between opposing artillery pieces, where both sides park their artillery behind their front lines because no one wants to park their artillery literally in the front line trench and then try to knock out your opponent's individual artillery pieces or batteries. Very few cannon are going to be able to fire more than 40 kilometers, so you might call that a rough upper limit. Move up to the operational level, and now there's probably higher level commanders involved and longer range weapons to go with it. Because now you're trying to target things that impact operational level outcomes. Not taking an individual hill, but rather the success of an offensive. And because many targets that fit that definition, things like airfields, major command facilities, or logistics infrastructure and powerful air defense radars, all tend to be positioned behind the lines, you need a weapon system capable of engaging them. And no amount of shorter range systems is going to provide a sufficient substitute. You could provide Ukraine tomorrow with 500 additional M777 howitzers, and it will have absolutely no impact on their ability to hit operational targets 65 kilometers behind the front line. While on the flip side, if Russian Iskanders destroy all the ammunition depots feeding those 500 M777s, then their ability to contribute at all to the broader operational outcome is going to be severely diminished. As you might guess, given the ranges involved, this is a bracket where you're going to see everything from long-range multiple launch rocket systems to tactical ballistic missiles and all sorts of air-delivered ordnance. Once you start talking about strategic targets, you're probably thinking about things like factories or critical infrastructure, things that broadly impact the will or ability of a country to carry on a war. And in many cases, these targets are going to be well, well behind the front line, perhaps in major cities. And in the case of the war in Ukraine, some of these targets may be within internationally recognized Russian territory, where they are rendered safer not just by distance, but also by Ukrainian agreements not to strike those targets using Western-supplied weapons. And in terms of weapons, unless the city is close to the front lines, you're probably going to be looking at the longest-range systems, with two common examples being cruise and ballistic missiles. If you want a quick imperfect example of what divides the three, if an enemy attack helicopter flies over Pavel and his mates while they're having lunch and so they grab their stingers and go to chase it, that's a tactical problem. If their commander then decides to call up a HIMARS unit and have it sling some guided rockets at the airbase that dispatched that attack helicopter in order to suppress enemy rotary-winged aviation over a wider area and enable broader offensive operations, that's probably an operational target. And if someone is then sufficiently annoyed by the whole incident to crash some long-range kamikaze drones into the factory that built those attack helicopters, then that's a strategic target being struck. The key point here is if you lack the ability to strike in any of these brackets, you may be at a significant disadvantage. If your opponent massively outmatches you in tactical fire, for example, tube artillery, then your troops may suffer from heavy attrition and a tactical advantage may turn into an operational one. At the other end of the spectrum, all the tube artillery in the world won't do you any good if your opponent wrecks all your ammo depots and transportation infrastructure, and because it's 2023, probably then post the videos of the strike on the internet for good measure.
Even before you go into the details of how this war has been fought so far, this provides a theoretical explanation for why Ukraine was always going to ask for longer range weapons. Because the ability to hit targets like depots, airfields, command centers, and logistics was always going to provide a mechanism to partially offset Russian advantages in terms of systems like tube artillery or helicopters. It's very important to note, however, that the weapon system is only one part of what makes these sort of attacks possible. Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance is absolutely critical. When you're talking about targets well behind the front line, you probably can't rely on forward observers to spot it using the Mark I eyeball. You need better systems to locate targets, whether that be a multi-million dollar satellite in orbit, or just Powell calling his second cousin Alexei and asking if the Russians are still hanging around at the old airbase. The point is without the tools to find targets, analyze information, and then allocate those targets to weapon systems capable of hitting them, you don't really have the capacity to do effective long-range fires. This is one way in which the modern battlefield is so different from that of most of the 20th century. ISR and networking tools are getting better, more accessible, and the battlefield is more transparent than ever. Indeed, modern ISR tools have become so good that ordinary members of the public now arguably have access to better tools than many commanders throughout history. To illustrate the point for a moment, let's take an example. Let's say you're just an ordinary person, and as I assume ordinary people do, you're spending your evenings browsing Russian state media, because what else would you be doing? And as you do so, you come across this absolutely ordinary and reasonable Russian story about an aircraft strike against Ukrainian facilities. This is a claim that Russian aircraft destroyed a Ukrainian hangar in the regional town of Berislav. And this wasn't just some hangar, no. The Russians knew that this hangar contained 25 military vehicles and no fewer than 200 Ukrainian troops. Because there is nothing more normal than a single hangar right on the front line being packed with a company of uniformed personnel and 25 armoured vehicles. And as well as knowing how many people and vehicles were inside, the Russians presumably through the power of X-ray vision knew exactly what vehicles were inside. Hence the report listing a range of vehicles from T-64 tanks and BMP-1s through to Max Pros and Humvees. Now some people will look at this report, take it as a given, and mark up 25 vehicles destroyed and 200 additional casualties for Ukraine. But if perhaps you took a more cynical outlook and thought that it might be possible that Russia was lying or exaggerating, there are a few tools available for you to check. And because I am a normal person with normal hobbies, that's exactly what I often do. So the first thing an ordinary member of the public might do is log in and check NASA's firm system. This is ordinarily intended to detect bushfires, but satellites don't really care why something burns so long as it burns. And a warehouse full of military equipment, presumably with at least some attendant fuel or ammunition, seems like exactly the sort of thing that might give a little bit of a thermal return. Alas, a quick check of the system on the 25th of May showed no fire-like signature in the town for the last seven days. But that's okay, there's plenty of reasons that an incident might not show up on firms even if it occurred. So if you want to be really sure, you're probably going to have to wait a week or two and then pull out your wallet. Because sooner or later, a commercial satellite will pass over Berislav again and take better imagery than the best spy satellites in the world could take during the mid-Cold War. And when that happens, it's a simple matter of paying up and then checking the imagery to see if any warehouses have been demolished. Because you can probably assume that a blast powerful enough to destroy a tank in a warehouse is probably going to do some structural damage to the thing as well. And unless Ukrainian deception operations extend to instantly rebuilding structures after they're hit by the Russians... We'd probably expect to see evidence of that, even if images are taken one, two, three, or four days after a reported strike. For example, when the new images come out, I expect some of those structures in the top left of that image to show as being damaged or demolished, because we have geolocated footage of them being hit earlier in May. My point is not whether or not this strike happened. I'm happy to leave that one to the audience. Rather, my point is that on the modern battlefield, it's increasingly difficult to hide anything from overhead assets even if it's only those available to ordinary members of the public. And if you can see something, you're a significant part of the way towards hitting it. All right, so let's give a little bit of context by establishing how well equipped both sides were for this sort of long range fighting before the war escalated in February of 2022. As we've discussed before, artillery and rocketry are traditional areas of Soviet and Russian strength. The answer to any given problem in Soviet thinking was usually going to be more explosive yield, with the only question being, what is the most efficient system to deliver that explosive yield to target? 
To that end, we know that Russia and before it the Soviet Union placed a greater emphasis on tube artillery and ground-based rocketry than did its Western opponents, with comparatively less, although by no means little, focus being placed on the role of the Air Force. During the Cold War, the Soviets integrated nuclear warheads into this family of long-range fires, everything from nuclear artillery warheads to nuclear air-launched cruise missiles. And while Russia has massively deprioritized that nuclear mission, it still maintains a range of modernized, legacy, or newly developed systems intended to be able to deliver guided or unguided fires into the operational depths. If you're talking about ground-based systems, good examples would be Russia's very heavy MLRS systems or its tactical ballistic missiles. Russia was believed to have about 120 300mm multiple rocket launchers in 2022. There were about 100 of the older 9A52 Smerch rocket launchers, and about 20 of the more modern Tornado S systems, which falls into that rather extensive category of Russian weapons that looks really good on paper, seems to be quite modern, is marketed extensively for export, but ends up being produced in very small numbers and rolled out primarily for parades. Now, I've seen people comparing the system to HIMARS. After all, M270 and HIMARS are just other sorts of multiple rocket launcher. And the argument often goes back and forth over what is the better system. HIMARS is more mobile and far more easy to reload. Whereas something like Tornado has a much bigger bang and a much longer range, capable of reaching out past 100 kilometers. The answer, of course, is they both have distinct strengths. And then on paper, they're both very lethal systems, just with different focuses. HIMARS is an American quarterback, a speedy little vehicle that's going to be making point passes all day long. Smerch is more like an East German shot put champion that's going to pick up a solid hunk of metal and then hurl it a world record distance through the power of communism and steroids. Hard hitting, long ranged, not particularly nimble. But if you want to throw a warhead even further, the Russians have their tactical ballistic missiles. Something like Iskander, NATO call sign SS-26, is going to be capable of hitting targets perhaps out to 500 kilometers rather than 100 or 150 which means even if the system has to stay a reasonable distance away from the front line to avoid artillery or counter-battery fire, considering 500 kilometers of range will basically get you from Minsk to Kyiv, you're probably going to be able to hit targets deep into the operational and strategic depths. And it's those sort of ranges that distinguish these systems from something like cannon artillery. When you start talking about reaching 40, 50, 100 kilometers behind the front line, suddenly you have a lot more targets available to you than just frontline defensive positions. Something that is worth noting, though, is that while these numbers are quite large and do represent a significant threat, they only represent a tiny fraction of Russia's overall artillery and MLRS assets. The vast majority of Russia's MLRS systems aren't these longer-range 300mm systems. Instead, that's the much shorter-range stuff, things like Grads or Urgan. And so while Russia clearly has this valuable capability, it's much more quantity limited and harder to replace than, for example, their stock of cannon artillery. Because while, yes, you can pull out cannons that were built in the Stalin era if you really need to, the Stalin and Khrushchev eras are not known for leaving behind a huge stock of long-range guided munitions. The other notable component of Russia's long-range fire capability obviously being their air and sea-launched cruise missiles, which we've talked about before, and so I'll mostly gloss over here. The two important notes here are firstly that Ukraine doesn't have any direct analogue to this kind of capability, or at least it didn't until very recently and even now only on a small scale. The other is that even though these weapons can quite famously be used to target civilian infrastructure like power plants or the Ukrainian capital, and indeed they have been used for that role, they can also be targeted at precision military targets. Training bases, airfields, the Russian Ministry of Defense, I believe, claims to have destroyed some HIMARS systems using caliber missiles, for example. So even though these weapons have the range to be used in a strategic manner against industrial targets, there's nothing stopping a caliber, for example, being used to strike a target of operational significance 40 kilometers behind the front line. That means, realistically, there's no military target almost anywhere in Ukraine that's truly immune from long-range missile attack. Ukraine obviously had no equivalent air-launched cruise missile in 2022, although it did have a number of ground-based options, albeit with a giant asterisk. For example, Ukraine's believed supply of 300mm MRL systems was about two-thirds the size of Russia's. And while it didn't have an equivalent to the much more modern Russian Iskander, it did have about 90 of the old Tochka-Uz systems. 
Totschka was seen quite extensively during the early months of the war. Because even though it was less precise with that large warhead and greater range, there were targets that Totschka could service that the Gimler's rockets from HIMARS just couldn't touch. And whenever people try and argue that Soviet and Russian weapons are terrible, this is one of the systems I like to point to and say, really? Because using this old ass Cold War system, the Ukrainians were, for example, able to completely wreck a ship in harbour at Berdyansk. And I'm sure if the Ukrainians had an unlimited supply of rockets for the Tochka or they would still be firing them regularly. The big problem, of course, is that Ukraine didn't have an unlimited supply of rockets for either of these systems. And as a result, we see far fewer examples of Tochka or Smerch being fired by the Ukrainians now than we did in the first months of the war. And for all the weird and wonderful things Uncle Sam keeps in the storehouses of the US Army, a massive supply of Soviet-era TBMs apparently wasn't one of them. Now, whenever you say Ukraine didn't have equivalent capabilities to the Russian Tornado S or Iskander, there will always be people who post comments beginning with the words, but what about? So to head those off, let's talk about a couple of niche Ukrainian systems quickly now. Prior to 2022, Ukraine either had developed or was in the process of developing weapons that were broadly equivalent to the Russian Iskander and the Russian Tornado S. Vilka M combined a modernized version of the old Smerch system with a guided 300mm rocket. That would give Ukraine something roughly equivalent to a Tornado S equipped with the most modern Russian guided projectiles. And we do have Ukrainian officials reported to have talked about Vilka being used in combat. The problem is the rockets themselves were hardly being mass produced. And it's hard to stand up that sort of production capacity in short notice in a country that is subjected to cruise missile attack. So while the system probably exists and is being used on a small scale, it is dwarfed in quantity by systems like HIMARS and M270. As for the HIM-2, this is a TBM, which hadn't even really completed development and gotten to the fielding stage at the start of the full-scale invasion. And the Ukrainians didn't report having any in service. And yet, the Russians claim to have shot down at least one Trim-2 missile. So I'm happy for now to leave the overall status of the system in question. The key is that if it does exist in service, it will be in minuscule quantities. And so unless there is a significant step change in production, remembering that even Russia has difficulty producing more than 60 Iskander missiles per year, again, Ukraine is going to be highly dependent on Western systems to engage targets that in an ideal world, it would engage with its infinite supply of Rim-2. So that's some theory and the arsenals involved. Let's talk about how the long-range fight has evolved over the last 15 months. Cut back to February 2022, and Russia begins its invasion with a massive advantage in long-range fires. And it leverages those assets to engage everything from Ukrainian air bases to troop concentrations and air defences. As we talked about before, Ukraine does have some systems with which it can answer during these early days, but those systems are prone to being easily depleted. There is far more demand for attacks by Tochka U than Ukraine has missiles to service those requests. And subsequent research that has come out by organizations like Rusi suggests that this early Russian advantage really is quite painful for Ukraine in the opening days. Russian stockpiles aren't unlimited, however, and I would argue they actually end up squandering a lot of their early advantage. Rusi suggests, for example, that between February and the beginning of May in 2022, the Russians fire more than 200 Iskander missiles. Some of these against genuine operational or strategic targets, but some of them against relatively minor concentrations of Ukrainian forces. And just to recall, that represents something like three and a half years worth of Iskander production fired by the beginning of May. Meanwhile, we've previously covered how Russia chose to deploy many of its air and sea-launched cruise missiles. Many of these were expended in wave attacks against Ukrainian power generation and transmission infrastructure in 2022 and 2023. Those attacks no doubt strained Ukrainian air defenses and inflicted some damage on the Ukrainian economy but they didn't break the economy or civil society. And one does have to wonder what would have happened if Russia had redirected those hundreds of state-of-the-art cruise missiles towards purely military targets instead. Russia would even fire a number of its long-range supersonic multi-million dollar anti-shipping missiles. The famous Onyx fired from the Bastion system, NATO call sign SSC-5 Stooge, directing these towards targets again in Ukrainian cities. 
In one report dated 27 May 2022, Russian media claimed that several dozen Ukrainian targets had been hit using the Bastion system over the preceding several months, which both demonstrated the depth of Russian long-range fire capability, but also the way in which they were willing to expend it. It almost seemed like Russia had looked at past examples of Western nations firing cruise missiles at Toyotas and seen that as something to emulate rather than as a cautionary tale. In short, Russia was unable to use its long-range options to a decisive operational or strategic effect during the early war. Having largely depleted its own stocks of long-range munitions, Ukraine received a massive shot in the arm when the first American HIMARS arrived, beginning with a seemingly token four units on or around June of 2022. Equipped solely with guided Gimler's munitions, this gave Ukraine a strike weapon with a range of about 80 kilometers. And so they immediately went to work using crews that were at least 30% caffeine and a target list that seemed to include just every major Russian ammunition depot along the entire front. How many Western MLRS systems are currently in Ukraine is a matter that is open to speculation and debate. On one hand, we believe that there are about 38 HIMARS and 23 M270s or equivalents that have either been pledged or delivered. And while we have plenty of video of things like the second story of an apartment building being attacked, we don't have any visually confirmed evidence of any HIMARS losses and Ukraine denies suffering any. On the flip side, Russia claims to have destroyed every HIMARS in Ukraine multiple times. So I'll leave that one to the audience with two key notes. The first is that Russia seems to enjoy reporting HIMARS destroyed far more often than it reports destroying M270s even though they are both very dangerous systems firing the same munitions and the M270s are only outnumbered by HIMARS roughly two to one. The other is that we know Ukraine has used decoy versions of HIMARS made of wood or inflatables. So it is possible that in at least some instances, Russia has destroyed these decoys and is claiming them as legitimate systems. The best term for the impact HIMARS originally had when it first arrived in Ukraine is probably disruptive. Russian and Ukrainian sources triangulated around Russia on occasion losing several ammunition depots per day. And while we probably won't know the full effect of their arrival until well after this war is over, it is notable that some of Russia's last truly artillery-led victories at places like Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, and Popasna all occurred before HIMARS o'clock was a thing. But while HIMARS continued to be extremely useful to the Ukrainians, For a variety of reasons, it wouldn't maintain the same effectiveness it had when it was first introduced forever. But given the lack of any other systems being supplied by its various allies, Ukraine would largely continue to rely on Gimler's rockets for longer range strikes, and continues to do so even now. But whether you're talking about Gimler's rockets or any of these other long range strike systems, it's important to come back to one of the core reasons that they have been so deadly in the war in Ukraine a transparent and highly networked battlefield where it's increasingly easy for commanders to identify targets to be struck, combined with weapons accurate and responsive enough to strike them. And in some ways, this has probably helped contribute to how slow moving the front lines have been. As one Rusi report observed, on a battlefield like this, the only ways to survive are to dig in deep, conceal yourself, disperse yourself so you're not actually worth targeting the first instance, or moving so quickly that you're impossible to target. But it's hard to be both dispersed, so you're survivable, and concentrated, so you're ready for an attack at the same time. Long-range strike systems mean it's harder to build up the ammunition and fuel depots you need to support a sustained offensive. It's harder to concentrate forces, whether during an attack or even at a reasonable distance, without being hit by artillery or long-range strike systems. There's also another observational advance as just a personal thought. And that is that most personnel in most armies are not infantrymen in the trenches. But in fighting like this, it's the infantrymen in the trenches who take the vast majority of the casualties. That means there's a constant need to make up for losses in the infantry units, which puts pressure on training establishments, and means that by now we've seen plenty of cases of the sides involved pushing individuals into infantry roles with relatively limited training. Historically speaking, artillery units take much lower casualties. When we talk about Wagner taking massive losses in Bakhmut, we're not talking about their artillery troops charging building to building. It's the prisoners and the assault units. And so while over time there might be pressure on training standards and unit quality in infantry units, 
there's room for artillery, rocket, or drone crews to just continue practicing their craft. They'll no doubt face attrition, but at a lower rate than their infantry comrades. And so over time, unit quality can actually trend upwards. Personnel can learn and innovate, develop new tactics, and become ever more deadly at executing their mission, whether it's reconnaissance calling for fire or delivering that fire. Which, in turn, makes life even more miserable and attrition even higher for the opposing infantry. And that difference in attrition may be one factor that goes into explaining why we've seen the kind of learning and adaptation we have in these sort of units on both sides. And make no mistake, the way that Russia uses artillery and long-range weapons in Ukraine has been changing and adapting over time. This video isn't primarily about tube artillery, but it illustrates the point well. A recent Rusi estimate suggested that Russia expended about 12 million artillery rounds during 2022. That rate of fire has now slackened significantly, and they're on track to spend about 7 million rounds in 2023 if current rates persist. The composition of that fire, that is what they're firing, is also changing in terms of mix over time, the way you would expect them to do so if they were ammo constrained in some areas. You see fewer MLRS strikes, fewer Iskanders being used, and Rusi notes a reduction in the share of artillery fire made up of the heavy 152mm howitzers. Instead, there's much greater use of mortars, glide bombs, and tank rounds to make up the numbers. And the counter-battery role increasingly is using lancet loitering munitions instead of saturating Ukrainian artillery positions with howitzer fire. Now, this probably isn't a long-term solution for the Russians. 7 million rounds per year is still well in excess of their estimated ammunition production capacity. But it does allow them to maintain fire superiority over Ukraine by leveraging the resources they have, things like tank rounds and mortar bombs, to partly substitute for those systems that are now in shorter supply. But part of what the Russian artillery has lost in terms of its quantitative advantage over Ukraine has perhaps been partly made up for by an increase in responsiveness and technique. Rusi notes that Russian artillery is reported as having become more flexible, more responsive, and that more commanders who possess the authority to call in fires are being given UAV so they can spot targets and call those fires. If Private Conscriptovich doesn't have the authority to order a new pair of boot laces, let alone an artillery strike, then it doesn't make sense for him to be the one trying to call it in. Instead, as you probably imagine, you can save a lot of time if you simply give the information in the form of UAVs and reconnaissance footage to those individuals that do have the permission to tell the guns where to point and what to shoot at. One quote contained in the relevant Rusi report, which I'll link in the description, is by a Ukrainian officer that noted that their unit was being circled by two different Orlan 10 UAVs and that each drone would be capable of calling in different sorts of long-range fire, presumably because they were being operated by different commanders who had different levels of authority and control over different assets. Now, this may not be the most elegant solution to the problem of inflexibility, but there's no getting away from the fact that there is significant reporting on Russian fires becoming, shall we say, more responsive over the course of this war so far. There's also evidence of attempts to learn in how very long-range weapons are used, not just artillery and drones. If you look at the recent Russian missile attack on Kyiv on May 16th, for example, it's quite different to many of the previous attacks. Whereas some of the old waves targeting Ukrainian power infrastructure were often aimed at targets across Ukraine, this was squarely focused on Kyiv. And despite different sorts of missiles being used, based on the footage that we have seen and the reports that I've read, it seems like the Russians coordinated it so the different sorts of missiles arrived in the engagement range of the Patriot system at around the same time. That makes a degree of sense if the intention was to overwhelm the Ukrainian air defense system and hit that target. In the end, it doesn't appear to have worked. The Russians claim to have destroyed five Patriot launchers from memory, but with no evidence provided. But it still demonstrates an attempt at least to try something different and that despite expenditure to date, Russia still has a supply of missiles like Kinzhal or Calibre that it can use in attacks like this, even if it is now operating under supply constraints. But if I can add a personal observation here, it's not just interesting the ways in which we have seen Russian long-range fires adapt to be more dangerous or to test Ukrainian defences, I also find what we haven't seen to be almost as interesting. In particular, we constantly see Ukraine making very good use of its HIMARS and M270 systems. On paper, Russia should be able to launch similar strikes in return using systems like Tornado S, 
If all Russian claims are true, they should actually be able to do so to a more deadly degree. These 300mm rockets are much larger, they carry larger warheads ranging from 150 to 250 kilograms, and some can reach out considerably further than the Gimlers can. Nor is the problem on paper an absence of accuracy. There are plenty of claims out there attributing a circular error probable of 1 meter to the 9M544 guided rocket. And yet, we don't see any significant volume of reporting on this system being used, neither by Russia or by Ukraine. There was some reporting in March of 2022, right at the start of 9M544 and 9M549 guided rockets being used, but for the most part, silence has followed. More Ukrainian systems by this point have launched several thousand Gimlers rockets at Russian targets. There are a range of explanations that could go to why this system seems to be absent. It could be that both sides are simply failing to report on the system. It could be that the rockets don't work as advertised. Or credibly, it could be an absence of that vital ammunition. The existence of 9M544 and 9M549 is not really in dispute. But I don't think there's reason to believe they entered into very high rate production either. And so while this system may have the range and warhead advantage over the Gimler's rockets of HIMARS, it's credible that like so many of Russia's most modern systems, they simply weren't produced in the numbers to make the difference they could have if they were available in quantity. With the United States increasing Gimler's production to 12,000 per annum, this might actually be one small area in which Ukraine actually enjoys a quantitative advantage. But even with thousands of rockets fired by the Ukrainians, hasn't been enough by itself to break the combat power of the Russian army in Ukraine. And that's because Russian adaptations haven't just been offensive in nature, they've also been defensive. Because, as I've said before, the Russian army is a learning organization, it is capable of adaptation. And nothing motivates rapid organizational change quite like precision-guided high explosives arriving on your command posts and ammunition depots. Although for those consultants listening, I would generally not recommend including that as an option when you're doing an organizational change piece. Russian responses to Gimler's fired from HIMARS were pretty rapid, and they had to be. Ammunition depots were exploding every day. And part of that change process has been pretty well discussed before, that is, the process of dispersing or moving things out of range. Instead of having large, gigantic ammo depots close to the front, they moved over to having dispersed smaller ammunition depots that might be hard to detect or not worth a strike. Meanwhile, major targets and command posts were either fortified or pushed further back. Emphasis there on fortified and or pushed further back, because the warhead on a Gimler's round isn't particularly large. So if you're well dug in into a reinforced concrete subterranean structure like a deep basement, HIMARS probably isn't a good choice of weapon system to try and dig you out of that location. Meanwhile, distance was the ultimately reliable defense, because it doesn't matter how many experience points an artillery crew earns. Physics, not the skill of the crew, determine the maximum theoretical range of a rocket or artillery shell. And so increasingly, the juiciest Russian targets were either dispersed, hardened, or pushed out of reach. And that's not to mention targets that were always out of range of Gimlers to begin with. Yes, the example everyone likes to bring up is the Crimean Bridge. Although I dread to imagine how many Gimlers rounds, given their relatively small warheads, it would take to knock that thing out. Remember, if you will, how many hits the Antonovsky Bridge took before it was finally rendered unusable in 2022. But perhaps more significantly, there are also things like logistical hubs, or airfields and command centers. Airfields make for a particularly good example because they tend to be populated by extremely expensive, extremely fragile things like jets that can both have a significant effect on the battlefield and make for really attractive targets for things like Gimler's rockets, if they're in range. In this way, the absence of a longer-ranged weapon has constantly hamstrung the Ukrainians because it precludes them hitting an entire family of very valuable targets that they can see but which, until very recently, were entirely, or practically speaking, out of reach. But there is a second mode of adaptation that I don't think has been talked about as much, and that is Russian attempts to answer the threat of systems like HIMARS and M270 using ground-based air defences. Now, some militaries, just like human beings, can become particularly focused on one or two options for solving any given problem presented to them. 
A firm that is really invested in virtual reality technology, for example, might try and solve every problem using it, whether it be something like gaming, where the technology is probably useful, or for something like business communication, where an email, a Teams call, or a bloody smoke signal is probably going to be a better method of communication. You could argue in some ways the US military is the same. Whenever an opponent deploys some new fancy form of air defence, the USAF's answer to that problem is always just to apply more air power until the air defences go away. You could argue Russia in part thinks a similar way, only with rockets and ground-based air defences taking the place of air power. Having a problem with Ukrainian jets? Add more ground-based air defences. Having a problem with shitty drones over Moscow? Put panziers on buildings in Moscow. Need to hit ground targets and buildings in Kharkiv? Well, you can use S-300 ground-based air defence missiles for that too. And so part of the apparent Russian solution to the Gimlis threat has been to treat them like any other form of aerial threat and engage them and shoot them down using air defence missiles. Now, initially at least, it seemed like Russia didn't have this capability in hand. During the Ukrainian campaign against the Antonovsky Bridge, for example, several of the Gimlis attacks were filmed by Ukrainian residents who posted the videos on the internet. That gave us an opportunity to see one of the most defended objects in Ukraine, presumably firing its air defence missiles, and yet the Gimlis rocket striking home regardless in many cases. But according to both Russian and Western sources, like for example the Rusi report I mentioned earlier, the quality of Russian ground-based air defences has improved over time. Rusi points out that the more static frontline has allowed Russia the time to set up air defence infrastructure around critical targets and to integrate its air defences with each other. And that, for example, hooking in short-range air defence systems like Pansir with the much more powerful radar arrays of other systems has helped dramatically increase the efficacy of those defences. Meanwhile, Russian sources claim that a software update improved their ability to detect and engage incoming Gimlis rockets. Whatever the cause or combination of causes, Rusi concludes that Russia is now assessed to be achieving a significant number of intercepts against GMLRS munitions. And Russian media has carried stories confirming and bragging about this particular fact, which I do find interesting given how much criticism has often been directed at Ukraine for sometimes using missiles to shoot down Russian drones. Because on the screen there you'll see an interview with a Russian commander who claims to have shot down some Gimler's rockets, using, as you'll see there, his book missile system. I found other references to S-300s being used for this purpose. Now, even for Russia, with its enormous stock and manufacturing capacity for air defence missiles, a book or S-300 interceptor is going to be significantly more expensive and harder to replace than a Gimler's rocket. And that's assuming they're not ripple firing against incoming rounds, firing more than one interceptor per incoming. So clearly it's not just Ukraine that has problem with the shot exchange issue. But for now, it's enough to say that this is a partial defence for Russia against existing Ukrainian munitions. The Ukrainians do continue to hit targets using HIMARS and M270. In some cases, the targets being hit are the actual air defence systems that are supposed to be able to intercept them in the first place. But we should probably proceed on the basis that the Russians are shooting down at least some of the incoming. And this goes some way towards explaining why, along with distance, dispersion and digging in, Ukrainian Gimler strikes probably don't have the same effect they did in July of last year. And so if Ukraine wants to obtain an advantage in this long-range exchange of fire, if they want to be able to overcome the Russian advantages in mass and now being on the defensive, then they're going to need a better answer to the question posed by this suite of Russian defensive adaptations. Fortunately for Ukraine, the United Kingdom enjoys rocking the boat, and the recent supply of Storm Shadow missiles provides a partial answer to some of these challenges. Moving targets out of range might have worked for Gimlers with a range of 80 kilometers, but it doesn't work when Storm Shadow missiles can hit anywhere in Ukrainian territory. Hardening targets by burying them underground is much harder against a system like Storm Shadow. Whereas Gimlers might struggle against a target like that, the 400 kilogram brooch warhead on Storm Shadow probably won't. It's a two-stage design where the first shape charge blasts a path through armor or concrete, allowing the second larger warhead to enter the target and aggressively remodel the vicinity. That warhead also means that larger targets like reinforced buildings can be legitimately engaged far more easily than they can with Gimlers rockets. 
I mean, really, this thing is more comparable in terms of target effect to something like Toshka or Iskander than it is to Gimla's. The image you can see on screen is in fact of a place where there used to be a building before a suspected storm shadow strike. And then finally, because there's no kill like overkill, it also adds a new defensive challenge. Because whereas Russian air defences have had almost a year practising against Gimla's rounds that follow an arcing trajectory and come in at high speed, Storm Shadow approaches its targets comparatively slowly, flying subsonic very, very close to the ground and following the terrain, trying to hide from air defences much the same way that Ukrainian and Russian pilots flying at very low altitude do. Plus, seeing as the missile's designed to be low observable or stealthy, you have to assume it's going to be considerably harder to pick up and engage than something like an Mi-8 helicopter, a design which has all the subtlety of a small bus when it comes to radar cross-section. Now obviously Storm Shadow isn't a complete or perfect answer in and of itself, even if it's exactly the kind of thing the Ukrainians have been asking for. But it does give the Ukrainians a way to better leverage their advantages in ISR because finally a greater percentage of the targets that Ukrainians can find will actually be within reach, if they merit the cost of engagement with an expensive weapon like this one. And it's likely that part of the reason Ukraine has been asking for a system like this or ATACMS for so long is because its introduction forces Russia to make some uncomfortable choices. Because while there may be ways to adapt to the threat that Storm Shadow poses, None of them that I can think of come without costs, just like the original adaptations to Gimlas didn't come without cost. For example, in order to move targets out of range, you'd have to push them back within internationally recognised Russian territory where the Ukrainians have agreed not to strike. But it's kind of hard to fight a war in Ukraine if all your command posts and logistics are in bloody Russia. You can further disperse your critical logistics or command facilities, you can spread out your supply depots and repair facilities, but you don't set up large storages and warehouses because you want the people working there to have a better social environment. You tend to set up large facilities because it's often more convenient. It is of course possible to run smart, decentralised, adaptive logistics. Not to nerd out for a moment, but that would probably require really good inventory management, good training, and a pretty well-refined transport solution. Russia doesn't have that, and so dispersion is likely to impose a cost. So too would increasing air defences to protect more targets against the new threat. Storm Shadow puts more targets in range, and so puts greater stress on the allocation of Russia's limited ground-based air defence resources. And given the capability of the system, you probably can't just put Conscriptovich on a roof with a man pads and tell him to go at it. You're going to need a system that can detect a target that is low observable and coming in at low level and then to intercept it in the narrow window between when it is detected and when it finally hits its target. The more you stretch those capabilities, the more you run the risk of just pulling too small a blanket from one part of the front to another, only protecting one area by leaving another underdefended or vulnerable. And finally, of course, you could choose not to adapt at all. You could choose to simply continue as you are, take the hits, accept the losses. But that then imposes quite a literal cost in the form of whatever gets destroyed by those incoming missiles. And also by the morale effect of your troops and officers understanding that nothing can defend them from this new threat. I suspect that part of the reason that Russia always claims to destroy a new weapon system as soon as it's rumoured to arrive, or indeed sometimes before it arrives in the case of the Bradley, is not just for foreign-facing propaganda purposes, but to support domestic morale. It's to show that these foreign weapons aren't as dangerous as they might be claimed to be, and to prevent personnel obsessing day in and day out over the potential threat they may pose. Tiger terror from World War II is not a unique phenomenon. Troops can develop rational or irrational fears of opposing weapon systems. And so while you might laugh at some Russian propaganda claims around destroying HIMARS, Remember that the messaging may be aimed more towards Russians and Russian troops than it is towards you. That isn't something I can prove, obviously, it's just a suspicion. But the recent introduction of Storm Shadow must be slightly bittersweet, I imagine, for the Ukrainians. Because while gaining these sort of capabilities now will likely be extremely valuable, it stands to reason that it would have been even more valuable if a system like this or ATACMS had been provided in the middle of 2022. Because while I've just talked about all the ways in which the Russian military has been able to adapt to Gimlers and may be able to partially adapt to Storm Shadow, the reality is that adaptation isn't a given. 
It can be a difficult process, and how difficult it can be compounds based on a number of factors. The intensity, the timing, and the diversity of the threat all play their part. If you introduce small numbers of a new weapon system, then all else being equal, you're probably going to have a lower chance of having a decisive effect with it before your enemy adapts. Continuously launch, for example, small bombing raids against an enemy that's never had to deal with air power before, and they will probably be able to survive those attacks, and then over time, if you give them time, learn how to conceal themselves, dig in, and adapt to the tactics that you're using. At the other end of the spectrum, if your opponent's first introduction to air power is Desert Storm, then no one's going to have the time, bandwidth, or capacity to deal with the threat. Because the sky is raining metal, the road is on fire, and everyone is running for their lives. The diversity of the threat also matters. The adaptation to Gimlers being introduced was to push targets out of range. But that wouldn't have been possible in the same way on the same timeline if Atakums and Storm Shadow had arrived at the same time to strike those more distant targets. All else being equal, introducing a range of new capabilities in quantity all at the same time is going to have a greater effect than drip feeding those same capabilities over a longer period of time. It also increases the odds of your opponent finding themselves in a true no-win situation, where the challenge faced is so great that, practically speaking, there is no reasonable adaptation possible. That said, there are reasons that Western governments have chosen to drip-feed equipment so far. There are also some big limitations on just how effective Storm Shadow is likely to be in Ukraine. With one key driver not being the capability of the system, it's clearly a very good missile. Rather, the problem is that there's only a limited quantity of these systems available. The United Kingdom stockpile is uncertain, but probably sits somewhere between 800 and 1,000, and they weren't due to be replaced until 2030. And so whether or not Ukraine gets a truly significant supply depends in part on how generous the Brits want to be. 10% of the stock probably isn't going to move the needle. 50% of it would. There is also the hope that the French might provide some of their Storm Shadow system as well, Scalp. The French originally ordered approximately 500 of the air-launched version of this missile. And again, the question is, how many do they still have and how many can they part with? Because unless they're willing to be particularly generous alongside the Brits, the Ukrainians are probably going to need to introduce other air-launched cruise missiles to keep making up numbers. And even if the decision is made to do exactly that, there's no guarantee that the introduction would be easy. Because even though Storm Shadow is being introduced now, what we've heard from the British Ministry of Defence suggests that they've been trying to solve the problem of how to introduce it for some time. Minister Ben Wallace openly talked about the difficulty of trying to integrate Storm Shadow with a Soviet-built jet. We now have at least one image of a Ukrainian Sukhoi-24 carrying this weapon. Now, in one sense, that's very cool and a fantastic accomplishment by the engineers involved. But on the other hand, just like integrating harm with the MiG-29, it points to a range of difficulties that come when you try and integrate NATO standard weapon systems with Warsaw Pact aircraft. Because as I've said before, trying to get harm to talk to the computer on a MiG-29 is kind of like trying to get a MacBook to talk to a clay tablet. It requires a little bit of work. And even though it may be possible, there's usually going to be some drawbacks involved. For one, it means a lead time between the decision to supply a weapon and it actually entering service. America could decide to supply air launch cruise missiles tomorrow, but if work hasn't already started on integration, then it may be some time before Ukraine can actually fire those things from their Soviet aircraft. The second element is you can lose functionality or features. Some reporting suggests this is what happened with the harm once it was integrated with MiG-29. The missile can be fired, it can be used to do its core job. But given the sort of hacked together nature of the integration, the weapon's not going to be able to perform the same way as if it was fired from, for example, an F-16. And the final problem, which might be more applicable to Storm Shadow, might be a shortage of launch platforms in the first place. Ukraine's Sukhoi-24s have had a very hard war. According to the Oryx database, a vast majority of the fleet is visually confirmed lost. So there's always the possibility that even if Ukraine got an infinite supply of Storm Shadow or Scalp, unless an alternative launching platform became available, there would always be the risk of all of the launch systems being destroyed or being down for maintenance. But despite all those difficulties and caveats, I want to come back to a core point. Storm Shadow was a significant announcement, and it represents a step change in Ukraine's ability to hold Russian targets at risk across all Ukrainian and occupied Ukrainian territory.
And the thing that I think has often been missed in some of the reporting around this issue is that Storm Shadow is only part of the apparent story, and that the growth in Ukraine's capability to hit targets at longer distances may only be getting started. Because Storm Shadow isn't the entire story, it's just one weapon. But recent Western efforts have been focused on building Ukrainian capability in a variety of areas. There's been an effort to build up new maneuver brigades and combined armed capabilities within the Ukrainian army so they can launch ground offensives. And at the same time, there's been an effort to build up their long-range fires. That's part of the effort that Storm Shadow is a part of. But as part of that effort, it's unlikely to operate alone. And so I quickly want to go through some of the other pieces of this evolving long-range fires puzzle. One of the more interesting items is probably this thing here, the ADM-160 Bravo Miniature Air Launch Decoy, or MALD. In a sense, the MALD is a testament to the American tendency to try and match counter-air threats by applying more air power. The MALD is a relatively cheap air launch decoy that once dropped from an aircraft is capable of imitating an aircraft's signature. Now, to put this in professional terms, the purpose of the MALD is to troll the shit out of enemy ground-based air defences to distract them or bait them into firing expensive interceptors and a cheap decoy. Now, news of ADM-160 in Ukraine was broken by the Russians, who posted an image of the wreckage. The Americans have not officially announced their supply. And as soon as news of this system in Ukraine broke, forums lit up with people talking about all of its exotic capabilities. For example, the ability of the ADM-160 to act not just as a decoy, but also as a jammer. That's actually only, as far as we know, a capability of the later ADM-160C model of this system. The Bravo model, the ADM-160B that you see on screen, is the older, cheaper variant that the US isn't buying anymore. So once again, you're looking at a case of America apparently sending older materiel. But for Ukraine, that may be all they need. The ADM-160 gives the Ukrainian Air Force a tool to distract Russian air defences or to bait air defence missiles. And if you're trying to fly sorties without being shot down, or to attrit Russian air defences, or to enable a storm shadow to sneak past Russian GBAD, then this is a really useful bit of kit to have. And in the event that enemy air defences are eventually able to distinguish between decoys and legitimate targets, there's reportedly also a version of the ADM-160 that can mount a small warhead. So that if you ever notice the Russians stop shooting at decoys, you simply switch out your decoys for weaponized versions, go destroy some targets until they shoot at the decoys again, start using decoys, and you can probably see where this is going. In air warfare terms, the ADM-160 is trolling given weapon form. And then there's weapons that sit at the extreme other end of the cost spectrum from Storm Shadow or Scalp. Storm Shadow is extremely capable, but you're going to be coughing up seven figures every time you fire one off. Not every kind of target merits that sort of special attention. A massive warehouse full of weapons, a repair facility, a massive ammo dump, or a command bunker, sure, that's Storm Shadow territory. But if you're talking about a smaller or less valuable target, Storm Shadow is going to be massive, hilarious overkill. Plus, Ukrainian air defences are presumably getting sick of having to deal with Shahed 136 attacks and so are determined to return the favour. And this is where Ukraine's growing family of long-range kamikaze drones comes into play. On one hand, the United Kingdom has a public program to supply hundreds of cheap long-range kamikaze drones to the Ukrainians. The report on screen about it shows, for some reason, an MQ-9 Reaper as the image, which is about as far as it is possible to be from the sort of drone this program will likely supply. Instead, you are looking at systems that have range, a decent warhead, and are relatively cheap. Suffice to say that in this war, as in many before, quantity can have a quality all of its own. And while it might be entirely possible, indeed barely an inconvenience for Russian S-300s or book missiles to shoot down cheap affordable drones, that's still more and more pressure being placed on Russian air defences. Also likely to arrive towards the tail end of this year will be the first of the production run of the ground launch small diameter bombs, or GLSDBs. Decision making on whether or not to fund GLSDB for Ukraine went back and forth over the course of 2022 before a decision was finally made early this year. In terms of capability, GLSDB is an interesting one. We've talked about it before, it's basically the fusion of a cheap aerial bomb and a wing kit with an old rocket booster to get it to altitude so you don't need an aircraft to carry it. The result is a system that can probably go 120, 150 kilometers, so significantly further than a Gimlet's rocket. Do it with a significant payload and very cheaply. 
The caveat, of course, is it's not certain how easy these things will be to shoot down if the Russians slam the air defences button again. After the rocket motor burns out and the thing is gliding, it's not going to be moving particularly quickly. So you might have a relatively wide window to shoot it down. But choosing to shoot it down, depending on which system you're using, might be a bittersweet event. Because this is yet another system where the weapon is likely to be considerably cheaper than the interceptor you fire at it. So in essence, what we're looking at is a cheap weapon system that might not be economical to shoot down in most cases that probably isn't going to be in Ukraine for some months yet. So the Russian military, in keeping with its time-travelling tradition of destroying weapons before they arrive, has already reported shooting down a GLSTB. And indeed, appears to have bragged about doing so using a book missile. Now obviously, I can't be sure how we should interpret this. It is possible that Ukraine received, for example, a small number of pre-production GLSDBs for testing or something like that, and that one of them was shot down by a book. Alternatively, this may fall into the same category as the time-travelling Bradley that managed to be destroyed in September of last year. The one thing that is very clear is that Russia is aware of the threat that GLSDB may pose and is willing to brag about shooting down Gimlers or GLSDB using Book or S-300 interceptors. Which, to be fair, is probably sometimes a military necessity. Ukraine has had to shoot down cheap drones using expensive systems on occasion as well. But I would still consider it very much a bit of a weird flex. The summation of all of this is that no one system or capability is likely to give Ukraine the ability to even up or win the long-range fight against Russia. That's a very tall mountain to climb, and if it wasn't for Ukraine's advantages in target selection, coordination, bomb damage assessment, and a dozen other soft factors besides, this probably wouldn't be as close a competition as it's likely to be. But Ukraine isn't receiving just one new system or one new capability. It's receiving a whole family of threats, all capable of operating at relatively long ranges. It's going to have low-cost attritable options, drones, GLSDB, JDAM ER, and maybe some other weapons besides. Those are likely to be supported by penetration aids like the ADM-160, and a small number of low-profile, expensive, but extremely lethal weapons like Storm Shadow or Scalp. Different threats require different defensive adaptations and may also set the scene for yet further capabilities to be introduced, complicating the job of the Russian defenders yet further. None of these new systems will give Ukraine a direct equivalent to something like the Russian Caliber, for example, but they're likely to be a significant step change over what Ukraine has been fighting with thus far. But with F-16 potentially entering the picture, a whole range of options are now very squarely on the table. Because whereas integrating a NATO weapon with a MiG-29 or a Sukhoi-24 is a long and painful process, F-16 will happily truck around half the weapons in the NATO aerial arsenal. And whereas NATO countries can come up a bit short on ground-based fires, in the air things are different. And if the political will is there, there's a range of systems that could be readily provided that would give Ukrainian F-16s the ability to launch effective long-range strikes. Meanwhile, on the ground, the option to introduce systems still remains. The big one would still be the introduction of a TBM, something like a TACMS. But only time will tell where the US decision-making ultimately shifts on that one. For now, it's enough to observe that Ukrainian capabilities clearly still have a long way to potentially evolve, so too to an extent to the Russians. But there's little doubt that by the end of this year, the Ukrainians will operate a range of long-range strike capabilities far beyond what they possessed before the war escalated in February 2022. Russia will have found a country with a limited aging stockpile of Soviet-era TBMs, and now be dealing with one deploying NATO standard air launch cruise missiles from NATO fourth generation aircraft. Now at this stage, I'd like to pause and recall that one of Russia's stated objectives for this invasion, this war that has claimed so many lives, broken so many homes, and destroyed so much civilian infrastructure, was to, quote, demilitarize, unquote, Ukraine. Well, as Ukraine begins to launch its first air-launch cruise missile attacks, and as its pilots train on NATO-built fourth-generation aircraft, I'll leave it to you in the audience as to how we measure Russia's progress against that stated objective. In any case, as we come towards the end of this presentation, I think it's worth stressing the point that the war in Ukraine is one of the most watched, I would argue, in human history.
And as a result, observations from that war are already rippling through the procurement policies of nations around the world. The apparent efficacy of systems like HIMARS in destroying targets behind the line have certainly captured attention, causing a number of nations to either expand or accelerate their ambitions to have similar capabilities in hand. Poland is perhaps an excellent example of this. Until recently, Poland didn't have anything ground-based with an equivalent range to the Gimler's rocket. They had placed a small order before February 2022, but the war in Ukraine has prompted a massive buying spree, with Poland looking to buy not just hundreds more HIMARS systems, but also South Korean Chunmu MLRS systems, and critically much longer range rockets like ATACMS or Gimler's ER to go with those HIMARS systems. That'll give Poland a ground-based reach not of approximately 80 kilometers, but of several hundred kilometers. Because if there happens to be a knife fight in the neighborhood, Poland would very much like to be able to bring a pike. Nor are the Poles the only European army looking to buy, and to buy quickly. Denmark and the Netherlands have both announced that they're probably going to be buying the Israeli Pulse MLRS system. And while I don't believe either have confirmed an exact warhead mix of what munitions they'll be purchasing with the weapon, Pulse offers customers both the Extra Missile, which is a 150 kilometer range missile with a 150 kilogram warhead, and the Predator Hawk Tactical Ballistic Missile, a system which can take a similarly sized 160 kilogram warhead, but this time carry it 400 kilometers. Another advantage of the Israeli system over a competitor like HIMARS or Chunmu is that Elbit systems can deliver relatively quickly, whereas just the existing order book for HIMARS and Chunmu will keep the Koreans and Lockheed Martin's production lines busy for some time yet. While the Danes and the Dutch have settled on their chosen system, Spain is reportedly still evaluating potential competitors. Meanwhile, Turkey continues its campaign to build up its own domestic military industry, including a whole family of long-range rockets. For those who are suggesting that the war in Ukraine has allowed Russia to demilitarize the countries of NATO, I would suggest comparing the systems that have been ordered by the various NATO powers to those which have been supplied to Ukraine. And then what you'll probably see is far from facilitating disarmament, the Russian invasion is instead driving the rapid modernization of NATO's various armed forces. And that's leaving entirely aside all those systems that are currently in development as opposed to in active service. Looking across defense firms in the United States, in Europe, or in countries like the Republic of Korea and Japan, there is just this dizzying array of development programs, all with the aim of improving the ability of those countries to hit targets at long range with precision. While Gimlers and Atakums may have become household names, they're actually relatively old technology. And the impetus provided by the war in Ukraine is only going to push these development programs faster. And along with those weapon systems, you should expect those countries to accelerate investments in the kill chain that supports them. The ISR assets, the communications and networking, the decision-making processes that enable you to convert increasingly impressive and capable long-range precision weapons into battlefield effects. On the flip side, militaries are probably going to have to give some thought as to how they survive on a battlefield that's increasingly dominated by very precise long-range weapons, supported by an ever-expanding range of sensors. Part of the reason Ukraine was able to do as well as it did, even before receiving systems like Storm Shadow, is that the various systems and practices that supported the weapons it did have allowed them to get more efficient use out of those weapons compared to the efficiency with which Russia was able to use its much larger stockpiles. In conclusion, the ability to strike into your opponent's operational depths is a significant capability. Russia began the war with a massive advantage in this area, but it arguably squandered some of that early advantage, giving Ukraine some opening to partly narrow the gap. The Gimler's rockets fired from HIMARS were a partial answer to this challenge. But given their limitations in range, warhead size, and Russia's evident ability to adapt to that weapon system, they were never going to be enough by themselves. Nor is Storm Shadow a complete answer in itself either, but it does represent a major step change in Ukrainian capability, one that will likely force an adaptation process on the Russian army.
and which I suggest is only part of an overall process of continually building up Ukrainian capabilities. Storm Shadow is the latest and by far the most capable Ukrainian long-range weapon, but I doubt it's going to be the last one. And as Ukraine begins launching strikes at ever longer distances, I suspect nations around the world will be watching closely, looking for any potential lessons. Okay, as normal, channel update to close out. Firstly, thanks to those who watched my video on Space Warfare last week. While it was a little bit different from the normal content, it was great fun to make. I'll watch how it goes over the next couple of weeks before deciding what the plan is with a potential episode 2. Secondly, a big thank you as always to my patrons. I put up a poll last week asking what sort of additional benefits the patrons might want in recognition of all the support they give, and somehow the most popular option voted for was that I should just take the money and get some more sleep rather than trying to provide any specific benefits. Now, I will try to do that, but I also would like to provide something back as a form of thank you. And so I'm going to start providing some snippets of cut content or cancel topics on Patreon. Just little bits and pieces here and there, both to say thank you and to give a little bit of a behind the scenes look. In terms of topics I'm currently working on, while not committing to any particular order, there's two that come to mind which build on what we've talked about today. There's one where I want to look at the global market for long-range precision fires and all the crazy development programs that are going on there, while the other will likely focus on the way Western strategy towards Ukraine seems to be shifting, in terms of things like aid patterns, how they're handling escalation risk, and what that might mean for the forward trajectory of the war. In any case, let me close out by extending my thanks to all of you who watched this video. Uh, thanks likewise to Private Incident Access for sponsoring this video. And I should see you all again next week.